Hello and welcome to Politics Joe. Uh, my name is Ollie Dugmore, I am the political editor and I'm joined by our correspondent, Ava Evans. Hello. Hi Ava. We're talking because I was very kindly invited onto Laura Kunzberg's show on the BBC this weekend and Ava and I are going to watch through some of the clips, react to them and talk about them in a way that you're not really afforded during the broadcast because obviously it's very intense, they're running through a running order and um, we get a little bit more time on here to talk about stuff. So uh, yeah. Let's get into it. Ollie, but what about your demographic? I mean, you provide news on social media, primarily targeted at young men. What was the response to the budget among your audience? I would say that it was obvious by what wasn't included. Mm -hmm. Housing, huge, huge problem for my generation. Um, the prospect of you face an economic and political choice when you're growing up. Either you can stay in the town you grew up in and not necessarily get the job that you wanted to or pursue the profession that you want, mm -hmm. or you move to an urban centre, Manchester, Birmingham, London, to pursue a career. Mm -hmm. However, your prospect of owning a home is very, very low in those kind of places. And what's the political consequence for the Conservatives of that, do you think? Well, potentially not that much. I mean, we've, right. we live in uh, a country with ageing demographics, mm -hmm. so you see things like uh, lifting the, the £1 million cap on the lifetime allowance for pensioners. Mm -hmm. There's a, like pension, pension reform, pension policy is a huge area of political gain. Mm -hmm. People don't really care about younger, the younger generation because you can't win an election just by catering to them. Okay, surely you're not a sceptic or a cynic here in the studio talking about <laughs> politics. That line didn't go down too well on Twitter, did it? No, there. it didn't. I don't know. People, people are accusing, like, there's some like, degree of bias or they're accusing me of cynicism. I don't know if that's um, necessarily fair, but yeah, there, was a little, there's a, there were a few little moments where I felt, because we were, I'm kind of like, you know, the left-wing voice on there or whatever, and from like new media. Mm. So there's kind of, there's like a degree of, you get qualifiers added. Yeah, new, new media just as a concept sounds quite trivial. Yeah, it does. Doesn't it? But actually that demographic that would have been watching BBC One on a Sunday morning, mm. I don't know how many <laughs> fans you would have had. <laughs> I mean, not to lament the situation, but I mean, going on BBC One to talk about, you know, young people and how we're so hard done by. I mean, that really does slide right into the the boomer arc of, my gosh, we're so ungrateful as a generation. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was trying to get at with, with that point. I wasn't trying to, I wasn't sort of like um, having a go at older people. It's a statement of fact that there's demographic change happening in this country. We are getting older as a country, mm -hmm. and I'm not trying to single out older people and be like, you know, boo hiss. What I just mean to say is that that is a significant electoral constituency, and I think Broadly speaking, the appeal of the Conservative Party since Thatcher has been you will own a house and we will ensure that the price and value of that house keeps increasing. Mm. And actually, as an electoral offering, it's pretty compelling, you know. But also, if you're someone who is in that bracket where you can now afford to give the wealth that you've accumulated through your home mm. onto your children, you see that as a rite of passage to your generational wealth. Mm. And so you don't want that taken away from you either. And actually, there'll be a lot of young people who don't want that advantage taken from them. But I mean, yeah, it's tough. I mean, the, you know, the local government authority in London say that we need nearly a quarter of a million homes built per year mm. to, in order to keep up with demand. But if you're to fulfill that quota, then you're taking away from these people yeah. who have you know, accumulated vast sums of wealth in their own homes. If you pit the two generations against each other, obviously no one's going to want to subscribe to that. Yeah, and I, obviously I wasn't, I wasn't trying to sort of like foment generational conflict with, with that remark, because obviously some people are capable of conceiving of how policy, politics and policy impacts other people, not least their children, mm. their grandchildren. Um, I'm not suggesting that you know everyone's sort of clutching, clutching their three-bed semi sure, close, sure. To their, close to their ch chest. But you're right; it's supply and demand. You know, if you build a quarter of a million houses a year, there's more houses, less scarcity. The price of them comes down. Yeah. But the point stands that budget. You know, there wasn't even an, an extension of the help to buy scheme. Nothing on rents, obviously. The hot button, the key political issue, which I think for our generation you probably could say is it is housing. Well, well there hasn't been a conversation about rent. I mm. mean, when the Bank of England put up interest rates. Straight away, we were talking about the knock-on effect on mortgage prices, how much homeowners will be paying extra, but no one, you know, we completely neglected to mention that landlords will put up the price of their properties on mm. their buy to rents, and that price goes straight on to renters. Renters haven't had a pay increase. Mm -hmm. You know, no one's talking about them or how they're able to afford their general life, you know, as a you know, a consequence. But unfortunately, the landlords, they've, they've, been, they've been smashed. They've been absolutely hammered by the increase in interest rises. Yeah. So we've got to do something about it. We've got to take care of them. Mm. Another clip? 
you said for many months, you and other colleagues sitting in that chair, you said it was not possible. You said more money was not possible. You said you could not talk about next year's pay review. And now that has happened after months of disruption for the public. A viewer of the BBC, David from Yorkshire, has told his story. I think we can show our viewers a picture of him. He had chest pains on a strike day. He was told it would be an hour and a half for an ambulance. That's somebody who had existing heart problems. Can you say to him and our viewers this morning that these months where you were refusing to talk was worth it? The Conservatives said there, were, there was no new money to give to the nurses and we've just had the spring budget and yet no new money was allocated to the NHS. So that means this money was always there. Mm. This money always existed. And going on strike or having these strike days was actually just a giant waste of everyone's time. I think that's the key thing to hammer home. I didn't get the opportunity to say this on the show. But they didn't come to me to react to that interview. Mm. But what I really wanted to talk about was that it emphasises and shows that all of these things are a political choice. If you look at the budget, freezing fuel duty, six billion quid. Where's that six billion pounds come from? It's a political choice mm. to, to make that. It's not, it's not like, oh my gosh, we don't have the money. The money's there. It's just, what do you choose to do with it? Mm. Do you freeze fuel, fuel duty? Do you reduce 11p, reduce duty on draft beer by 11p? Do you increase funding to the MOD because of the war in Ukraine? In the answer to all of those three things, it's yes, yes, and yes. When it comes to, are you going to offer a pay rise to the nurses, are you going to offer a pay rise to, I mean, I think probably the train drivers is the best example, right? Because the government indemnifies the train companies. Mm -hmm. Every day is a strike day. They're not, lo the, the, the train operators aren't losing money, which I think is such a key point to make. The, obviously the whole point of a strike is you go on strike, your, your, your employer loses money, it drives them to the, bar to the bargaining table to come to a resolution with you. If the government is covering the costs for those companies. They have no incentive to negotiate. And the most infuriating thing about all of it is that the government has now spent more indemnifying the companies yeah. than it ever would have costed to give the train, the train, the rail workers the pay rise that they wanted. But the knock-on effect of that is that businesses like hospitality, which is the third largest sector in the UK, mm. that loses out. But those industry heads don't have a seat at the table. So yeah. the people who are frustrated aren't indemnified mm -hmm. and don't get to talk in the negotiation. So mm -hmm. actually what you end up creating is a, is a culture war. There are now restaurant owners who are furious with you know, someone who cleans trains because they want to get more money because they've, they're out of pocket. Yeah. It, it's, it's a fantastic strategy for you know, bargaining division. conservatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. The other thing as well I would say, I don't feel like too like inside baseball or like journalism nerd, but it is quite impressive being sat in there. Like you, you got, you're kind of like viewing it. You're so close. You're like right next to where the minister is. You're like watching the two of them sat opposite each other. And as someone who has interviewed politicians, it is. I wouldn't describe it as like a fanboy moment, but <laughs> it is like quite. Um, it was cool to be able to sit there and like watch her interview, how she strategizes and what she does. But, and I think this touches actually a point that I said at the beginning of this video, because of the broadcast format. And this is probably one of the problems I had with the contribution. You don't get very long to speak. You got about a minute on that panel when I was talking. I realised that as the further it went on, you kind of have to pick your bits, be like, okay, I'm going to talk about Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. What do I have to say about Boris Johnson? Let me send 30 seconds. And th because they have less time. And that translates to the interview as well. Uh, previously, I always used to get like, angry at Piers Morgan or whoever for being so adversarial, so confrontational, so aggressive, because this, this ruins the conversation. The minister gets their back up. They're not going to talk to you. And it's a product of the fact he's got an ad break in 10 minutes' time. He knows that the politician will play for time and just obfuscate and not say anything. He has to press them and press them. And so when you have that time pressure and you really are trying to get an answer out of the minister or whoever you're being interviewed, it was interesting to see that and contrast that with what we do, you know, mm. where we have the space and time. We're not running to anything. The only prep time pressure is how long the person's given us, and it's usually about half an hour. So if they want to waffle for three, four minutes, you can kind of, at the end of it, you can go, do you want to have another go at that one because you didn't really answer what I asked you? You, as a panellist, have to put forward your best point. Mm. So do you think that that made you, I don't know, get into a bit more of the character of <laughs> left wing new media? I don't know. Uh, no, I, I actually think I didn't do that very well. I can't remember what, what, it, what the question was now, but they, they asked me something. Oh, it was um, like banning TikTok. Mm. And, I start, and I started off by saying, well, I don't think that um, cons like the, the product, the product for all those social media companies is us. You use Facebook, you use Instagram, you use TikTok. You are the product that the social media company sells to advertisers. They sell your profile, who you are, and then ads get served to you. So I was beginning off by saying, I don't think people are fully aware of the level of surveillance 
that these companies put them under, if a government was to surveil you in that way, there'd be like riots, but because they show you videos of people dancing, you accept it. I don't think people are fully clued into that choice they're making. And before I could get all the way into that point, the, um, the tech guy sat next to me, Brent, was basically like, well, customers have agreed to, the, agreed to sell their data and then started talking about something else. And, I, and it's kind of like, well, actually, I think the point I was trying to make is I don't think they have fully consented. I don't think, yeah. they, are, I don't think they are aware that they're being surveilled in the way they are. And if you're saying, well, you agreed to the terms and conditions when you signed up to TikTok. It's like, oh yeah, how many fucking people read the terms and conditions of TikTok? Yeah, right. and even like even cookies. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. we've become so desensitized to accepting cookies on every single mm. website that you go onto. It's just like a natural reaction, like, yes, I'll take it. But you know, what, what are you being served in return? I mm. mean, when we talk about Cambridge Analytica, we haven't talked about that in ages, mm. or election fiddling or anything like that. Every single website that you're using or you're clicking on, you are now creating a profile for yourself. And it means that when we get into election season, you're going to be served adverts based on what you've clicked on, even if it's really random. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have been looking up, you know, far right ideology. You might have been looking up Tommy Robinson because you found him attractive. I don't know. Do what you want in your own time. I do. But <laughs> over the next couple of years, that slow burn, the, the result of that is that you are being served content that yeah, actually yeah. might convince you into believing, you know, how he feels. I think that's the key thing. I'm glad you mentioned Cambridge Analytica because you don't have to, I, I don't want us to have a conversation about, oh, did they influence Brexit? Did they influence the US election? You don't have to, that, that in a way is almost irrelevant. Mm. What do you think they're selling? What's the service that they're selling? Do, do you think people, yeah, maybe they did influence selection, maybe they didn't. What do you think people were buying? The people who were trying to influence selection, what, what was Cambridge Analytica offering? Yeah. And it's this insane psychometric profile of hundreds of thousands of people that if you sign over your Facebook data, they know. They know when you're asleep because you're not on the app. They know what your commute is because they're geo-targeting you. They know when you're angry because of the, the, the language analysis, the comments you're writing. Mm -hmm. they, know when, they know when maybe you're like either a bit sad and melancholy or, or, or like lusting for an ex because you've gone onto your ex's Facebook profile. Yeah. They know all of this stuff about you and they can build a very complete picture of you as a person. Do you, th do you, th do you think that's a problem? Forget. Did they influence Brexit? Forget, did, did they meddle with an election? That, for me, is the, is the really big story. Well, that was the point you were making about our discourse politically around what we're doing online is so far away yeah. from the fact. So, yeah, the consequence of Cambridge Analytica was for everyone to have a big debate about Brexit. And no, it's, it's never been about that. Over the weekend, people on Twitter were outraged because they had been sent electoral forms but they've been sent by the Conservative Party, which is mm. fine, that's, that's above board, they're allowed to do that. And it's just like a way of the Conservatives kind of getting market research on you. And people were really angry about this. They were mm. like, why are the Conservatives allowed to send a letter into my home? Okay, why have we never had a conversation about what you're doing online and mm. about how certain political parties or political leaders are able to actually be way more intrusive mm. and you are consenting to that. Well, most of the time they buy the data from um, credit agencies, mm. you know, like Experian, Ooh. whoever, they build these profiles. You Particularly, you know, if you've got like a loyalty card at a supermarket, they track all of that, they've got all that data, they've got your credit card, they've got your bank, they've got your utilities, you know, they have a, com they have a pretty complete picture of who you are, where you live and your socioeconomic status. Um, and yeah, political parties buy that so they can target you. What do you think it says? that they'll know I was the second biggest consumer of green peppers at my local Sainsbury's. <laughs> <laughs> Vegetarian, probably a Labour voter, yeah, no, yeah. good. Um, let's watch that clip. You mentioned about um, sort of, yeah, how far behind politicians are from the, what's happening digitally. We spoke about it on the show. Let's watch that. And... It's insane that the people at the frontier of this stuff are generally sort of 15, 16, 17 year olds. That's who, as a society, we're trusting to navigate these incredibly complex, difficult, dangerous issues. and. You know, to be clear, social media and, and, and digital media and phones, it can be the gateway to friendship. It can be the gateway to uh, consensual sex. It can be the gateway to going out, socialising, gigs, all of that brilliant stuff. It can also provide you with access to extremist politics, to, well, yeah, dangerous, the revenge porn, all of those kind of dark, dark parts of the web. They exist out there as well. Um, the people who understand it best are the people that have grown up with it. It is that younger generation. And frankly, the fact that I think our, our discourse politically, mm -hmm. uh, nationally, is just so far off the pace. It can be the gateway to consensual sex. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Everyone on the panel nodding furiously. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's why Brent's a tech guy. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I, 
we were talking about it just now, right? I don't think, um, I think the co our conversation about digital rights and kind of the frontiers of what's acceptable, our discourse around it is so insanely poor. Uh, shall, shall we ban TikTok on government phones? Mm. For, oh, all right, fine. You can have that conversation. Why have they got Why have they got TikTok on their government? Why does Grant Shapps need TikTok? Yeah, okay, fine. If it's on his personal one, he makes his campaign videos. Why does a government minister need TikTok? I don't think he should have anything on his phone. I think he should have an email and a phone number, and that you know, yeah. and that's the end of it. You get 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 rid of WhatsApp as well. You've got an advisor who could be doing yeah. your social content for you. They can they can do that for you. But the point the the point I was trying to make there, like take an example. We were talking because Georgia Harrison was interviewed on the show. Um, suffered this horrific example of uh, revenge porn by Stephen Bear. He uploaded a video of them having sex that she hadn't, I think it was like CCTV or something like that. It was, it was, anyway, she didn't consent to it being published, full stop. Mm. He put it on OnlyFans originally, so she wasn't really aware of it because not many people were buying it. Gets uploaded to Pornhub, goes massively viral, and yeah, takes over her life for two years. He's now gone to prison for 21 months, I think. So to talk about pornography, Deep fake porn, for example, you know, taking someone's face, superimposing it onto, onto porn. What does that say about people's image rights? What does that say about someone's privacy? Tell me a politician that's talking about that. And it's all over the internet. You know, that, that's kind of what I'm getting at by how far behind we are from the conversation. Um, and it's not just that. It's, it's um, you know, access to uh, drugs, extremist politics. You can you can log on to Telegram, and it's, I mean, I'm not even talking about the dark web or you know mm. using the onion the onion um, using Tor to get anywhere. Uh, this is stuff that you can just download an app onto your iPhone and Snapchat. You can buy drugs on yeah. very easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't think people are who are legislating around this stuff are really have any clue that that's the sort of thing. And I but I should add a caveat, which I did on the show. We also shouldn't just be talking about digital and social media as like this big evil beast um, because children, children bully each other in the playground, right? They bully each other online. They also form meaningful, lasting friendships yeah. in the real world and digitally. And you, to, to categorise all of social media, all of digital communication as this like, horrific thing, I, I think is disingenuous as well. Well, like anything, it's not homogenous, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, but yeah. Um, even watching, though, the Culture Select Committee we were watching that together and they were discussing disinformation on the internet. Mm. And you're watching someone who's been brought in to give evidence to a panel of MPs. The level of discourse is probably where we should have been 10 years ago. Mm. The chair of that select committee actually posted a deep fake not too long ago and was like, I cannot believe someone has superimposed Jacob Rees-Mogg's <laughs> face onto this photograph. It is so realistic. And you go, oh my God. <laughs> These are the people in charge of potentially the, you know, of scrutinizing the online safety bill that's coming out. Mm. If you don't know, people can, I mean, that wasn't even a deep fake actually, that was a Photoshop. If you don't know that's possible, yeah. how are you in the right headspace to, to scrutinize this incredibly important piece of legislation? Digital literacy is uh, fascinating to me. People, people that have grown up, particularly in, in sort of like the hyper social media, internet, uh, smartphone era, are so much more digitally literate to the point where I'm in a lot of far right um, Telegram channels for, for for journalistic purposes. Cut that bit out. Just leave it like that. <laughs> I'm outing myself. I am in the far right, um, and the sort of the the memes, the posters that they advertise their counter demos with, it looks like something you would have made in like your year seven IT class. Do you know what I mean? Like clip art. Yeah. Type design, and I find it fascinating that that. That communicates effectively to, the, to that sort of generation of, well, they're not all boomers, but older people in the far right. That's the digital language that they understand. If I was trying to mobilize counter protesters, let's say, to one of those demos, let's say, you know, it's outside a hotel or whatever, and you hear that the far right are going, so you organize like, the, an anti fascist demonstration tries to go there. If you tried to get them to go with a poster that looked the same as the far right one, it would not mobilize people to go because they think it was a joke. If you sent that to, I don't know, like a 16-year-old, they'd laugh you out the fucking room. Mm. Or they might think it's ironic. Yeah, or well, yeah, well, there's that. And that's another whole layer. To, I don't think MPs realise... The subtext of that, yeah. It's too long. You know, it, we talked about Tate uh, on the show as well, and I don't think people... The way that 4chan, those forums, are dripping in irony. 
And the things they're saying are uh, explicitly, provocatively racist, sexist, homophobic. But in they're kind of they're doing it for the lulls, right? You know, it's like ha ha ha. We've said this deeply provocative thing deliberately to provoke these people, but we don't actually. Well, they say, oh, but we don't actually think it. But obviously, you repeat something so many times. How how often are you going to say something atrocious and then be like, actually, that's not what I think? Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like the irony of it is a deeply important point. And again, I don't think um, I don't think anyone on the DCMS Select Committee is like is tuned into that. Let's talk uh, about Andrew Tate then, because we talked about that on the show as well. Next clip. Yeah. How do you make sure that young men are aware of the kinds of damage, the kind of distress and hurt that they might cause? Yeah, there's, there's a broader context to Andrew Tate. And the first thing is, Andrew Tate did not invent misogyny. Misogyny exists in our society. It is pervasive and it enables people like him to sound off and sort of activate those sentiments within, within people. So I think that's an important distinction to make. Secondly, he has his part, his message sort of, it starts off, it's kind, it kind of, it hooks you in with a, you know, men should look after themselves, men should look after the people. And you go, kind of, oh, that sounds fairly reasonable, looking after other people. And then it, it spirals and it gets more extreme, more dangerous and more hateful. There is a route to helping those young men mm -hmm. that starts in the same place, that starts with a, have you considered how you're looking after and helping other people? And then instead of spiraling into a hateful message, you start talking about positive male role models. Mm -hmm. A great example, the BBC's covered this story extensively, Kevin Sinfield, what he's doing with Rob Burrow, you know, mm -hmm. an incredibly tough, hard man, much in the same way as Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate used to be a kickboxer. Kevin Sinfield, rugby league player. Mm -hmm. it's and tough. he's helping to yeah. campaign and, and raise money about, for motivation. But he also talks easier. about how much he loves Rob Burrow, his friend. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an open expression of masculine love, which is something that doesn't actually exist very often in our society and culture. So. I think it's important to distinguish that you can, you, if you co-opt the means by which he's communicating with young men, mm -hmm. but you display a positive message, it's possible to speak to them and help them in a way that, you know, that doesn't send them down a, a rabbit hole of hate and fear. I was really nervous to talk about that. Mm. Andrew Tate is a much more complex phenomenon than just there's this guy out there spouting, spouting misogyny. It, it taps into sort of much broader questions about masculinity and what younger men um, are doing. And, and again, like, this comes back to the other, co other conversation, consuming online. Huster's University, the, the, the sort of what would appear to be a bit of a Ponzi scheme uh, thing he set up, you pay like $50, $50 a month or something to, to, to join this. And then all of these people he's convinced to sign up are told to edit content, and they particularly publish it on TikTok, from his podcast appearances with an affiliate link. If someone signs up to the Hustles University from the affiliate link in that video, that person then gets a twenty gets half of the of the monthly fee of the first month. They get $25. So he creates this army, basically, Pyramid of, con scheme, yeah. of content creators creating videos about him and getting published on TikTok. If you have no real affiliation or care for like the brand image of Andrew Tate or <laughs> the significant societal consequences of perpetuating like violent misogyny against women, mm -hmm. you are going to edit the most extreme stuff that he says on a podcast, put it into a 10 second TikTok that's going to go massively viral because either people who aren't misogynists are gonna watch that, hear him say something horrific and go, who is this guy? What's being said? I need to watch this video. Or if you agree with it, you're also watching it and going, wow. And so you get this massive viral, viral spiral effect with all the content that he's created the conversation we were having before. I, d I don't think, I don't think um, Steve Bryan, who's on the DCMS committee, or any of those other, I don't, think, I don't think they're tuned into that. No. I don't think they're tuned into that at all. Um, and that was kind of the, the point I was starting to make on there, is how do you combat that? Is it, is it with examples of positive male, male role models? I th the, th the other thing I probably would have liked to have said, which I think is the thing I was probably more nervous about, is that if men, if the, if, if, if the only way men conceive and see masculinity being discussed nationally is you are emotionally repressed, you don't talk about your feelings, you, you've all got mental health problems, you need, you need to ask your mate, is he okay? You need to go and have a madri, you need to go and ask him if he's okay. That's what you got in the national discourse. And I think that it probably is, I would say now, the most pervasive, pervasive sort of conversation around men and, and, and modern masculinity, I, I think. And then on the other hand, you've got this guy who basically says to you, 
get your shit together, start working out, start working hard, working hard, hard, <laughs> start working hard, why, why are you watching this video? Go and do something productive. And you hear that and you go, oh actually that's like, that's like an active expression of something I can do to improve myself rather than being told that I'm depressed and that I don't talk to my friends, which maybe I am, but I do talk to my friends about it. But you know, the last person to do this who was the last big person in the discourse was Jordan Peterson. Yep. And then the person before that was Peter Hitchens, mm. I would say. And I think with every new phenomenon, there's been a sort of move in the dial a bit more, a bit further right. Like Andrew Tate is actually very difficult to summarize. It's very difficult to sit down and say five objective misogynistic things that he said. Mm. It's a slow burn, I would argue. I think there are now clips which yeah, are yeah, which yeah. have surfaced which are but if you are the average 14 year old boy who consumes a lot of Andrew Tate you're like this guy's just telling me to make my bed and play some chess <laughs> I don't hate women yeah but it's that slow burn which is Andrew Tate videos become the gateway to 4chan and and to different forums mm -hmm. and that's how you end up in a space where young boys hate women yeah and I think that's what uh, pr probably one of the other things that was I was nervous about I don't think we can do justice, not, it's a weird way of phrasing, I don't think we can do justice to Andrew Tate, the subject of Andrew Tate, even now in like the five minute conversation we're having about yeah. it. It's really complex and the point I made earlier about you've basically got like 30 seconds to a minute to say something, how do I talk about this guy effectively in that, and unpack it, what it means in that time, it's really, really hard. Um, but yeah, you're right about Peterson and uh, interestingly, Peterson's kind of, um, spiraled now into sort of, like he's almost like a, fi he's mocked now on the right, on the online right. Yeah. Which is because he tweeted that fucking photo <laughs> of the, um, well, did he, he thought it was like a co Chinese Communist we Party. We should insert it here. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chinese Communist Party, like fertility machine place complex. And it was actually like a video from a BDSM mistress's dungeon. And he, digital literacy, he couldn't, yeah. he couldn't tell that it was, that what he was, I think he was told that it was like in the CCP or in China somewhere. He couldn't tell that it was like obviously a joke in the way that if you or I saw it, we'd be like, fuck me, that's, <laughs> that's not what that is. Yeah, which was also the general consensus of the photo. Yeah. That was the, uh, <laughs> that was what it was giving. Yeah, that was, that was atrocious. But yeah, and now he, he's become like a, um, an object of, an, op an object of mockery on the, yeah. on the online right. But it starts with, Pretty, all of these guys, the self-help advice that they're, gi that they're giving, it's like 50, 60 years old. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's, it's like Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. It's like, be nice to people, use their name, exercise, you know, drink water. Yeah. What's your skincare routine? Yeah. 